a beautiful spring afternoon. Oh, believe me, I'm glad to see it. I got very tired of the winter. <laughs> well, about your time, cat, that's such an interesting book and different, too. How did you happen to choose to write about a cat? Well, now, first, you might be surprised when you realize how many authors use things out of their own lives, even when the book seems to be very imaginary. And this is what happened to me. Now, I chose a cat uh, because we have cats here at home. Matter of fact, we have five of them. And you know what What really gave me the idea? Well, I was, was sitting in my living room one day, and all of a sudden, one of our cats just sort of appeared out of nowhere. And I looked, and I didn't see him come into the room, and I turned away for half a minute. And next thing you know, he'd gone. He just vanished somewhere. And I began thinking to myself, well, you know, suppose, suppose he were traveling back through time. Because, you know, they say cats have nine lives. <laughs> and of course, this isn't true because cats have one life, just uh, the same as all of us. But I still said, all right, let's let's just pretend that a cat does have nine lives. All right, why couldn't he spend one of each of his lives in a different place in some different time in the past? So that's really how the idea got started. How did you decide which times or which periods in the past that you were going to use for these nine different lives? Well, now, first I, I thought back and I, I looked up in all my history books and I found out that there were certain particular periods of time when cats were very important. Now, for example, the, the very first story in Time Cat uh, takes place in ancient Egypt. Now, cats indeed were worshipped in Egypt and this was a, a natural place to have one of the stories. And, uh, for example, in Japan... Uh, cats were introduced into Japan from China, and the Japanese uh, thought uh, they were almost uh, like little toys. Mm. So this was a, an important country, an important life to have uh, the cat uh, visit. And uh, let me see a couple of the others. Uh, in the United States at the time of the Revolutionary War, uh, peddlers uh, really carried cats around with them and sold them uh, to farmers and uh, their wives as Mouse catchers. Oh, for goodness sakes. We like that one uh, so much because the uh, nature's finest mouse catchers. <laughs> well, you know, this, this is absolutely true, and I think this is one of the reasons uh, why cats spread throughout the colonies and uh, throughout the United States. That's exactly how it started. You said you uh, went back and found places in history where cats were important. Now, did this sort of evolve over, uh, say, several years? Well, I, I started out on research. As a matter of fact, I must have read almost 40 books. Uh, let's say there are nine different countries, nine different stories, and I think I must have read about five books of history and biography and all kinds of, of research materials about each country. Of course, I, I had half an idea because I'm so fond of cats that I knew a little <laughs> bit about their history. And I knew, for example, about the ancient Egyptians, mm -hmm. and I knew uh, about the Romans and, I, and different things. And I, th these were my clues where I could look first. Oh, but it took an awful lot of reading. You'd be surprised. A, a writer reads uh, dozens of books before he writes even one. Well, that, I think, is an interesting thing to know. Um, now... Is, then it's true that there was an old cat company. In oh Cooper's yes, Army? indeed there was. Mm -hmm. Indeed there was. Mm -hmm. And the the interesting thing is that although the story is, well, let's call it a fantasy because we know that a, a cat and a boy can't really go back through time. But once they're back in the country, this is exactly accurate. Uh, this it's really historical uh, and authentic story, and this is uh, uh, just the way it might have happened. In other words, this tells exactly how people lived and, and acted in those times. Yeah, that's right, and this is where I did a lot of research on the story, too. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you get names like Neither Can and the Egyptian story and Sir Dick Longtooth in the British story? Ah, uh, well, the, the name of the pharaoh in the first story is a real name, and this was uh, uh, one of the ancient pharaohs uh, just about the time that story takes place. I probably didn't pronounce it. Uh, Netter Ket was his name. Netter Ket. Cat almost sounds like cat, doesn't uh, it? And I have an idea that's probably what it means, and, I, and this is what attracted me to the name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how about Mongols in the island? Uh, well, now these are authentic names of uh, people who would live on the Isle of Man. Mm -hmm. And, of course, 
some of them are invented. Of course, a real name that everybody would know is Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, in the which I didn't make up. <laughs> <laughs> did Leonardo da Vinci write his name backward uh, on, a, on a picture? Uh, yes, he did. Well, first, uh, from what I read about him, I think the very first painting that he made was of a kind of uh, scary cat, uh, sort of an imaginary uh, kind of a thing that he had painted. This was, I think, the very first thing that he had painted. And yes, you know, it's absolutely true that uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote uh, backwards in a kind of mirror writing, and he he did that. He kept his journals and diaries that way so that nobody else could read them. Oh, for goodness sake. And I believe that uh, he was also left-handed. Hmm. So this this is a, a true detail. This is a surprising thing, how many things you learn uh, from reading all the different books. Do cats appear in many Irish fairy tales? Oh, yes, they do. Uh, sometimes in the fairy tales they're supposed to be uh, as big as a horse. Everybody's fascinated with cats. You'd be surprised how many fairy tales have cats in them all over the world. Mm hmm did uh, St. Patrick then bring cats into Ireland from Rome? As well? well, you know, this is a little detail that I I took a little bit of liberty with that. I don't know for sure whether he uh, brought any back. And yet, if, if we can uh, let ourselves use our imaginations, I don't see why we couldn't imagine that uh, when he went back to Ireland, he might have taken a cat with him. Uh, we know that there were cats in Rome. Uh, and this is, this is why I thought, well, all right, if I... I'll maybe make this up, but it, but still, it's imaginary, and yet it's not uh, it's not really untrue. Yeah. Nor impossible. And it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. How about the people on the Isle of Man? Do they take cats on their fishing boats for luck? Well, this is this is what I read. Now, of course, I've I've never been to the Isle of Man myself, but this is what I read, and I I don't know if they do it still today, but at one time I believe they did. How about note-taking? Do you take notes, or do you carry it in your head? No, I'm afraid too much for my poor head. I have to take <laughs> as many notes as I can. What I've found, too, is that I've always learned something from every book I've written. You start out, and maybe you don't know quite as much as you'd like to, but in the course of writing the book, actually, you grow up a little bit, and you're a little different person at the end than you were at the beginning, and I think you know more. Yes. It takes me almost a year to write a book. That's, that uh, seems a long time. <laughs> and I think this is uh, good for young people to know because I think sometimes they think... Oh, I've heard some know. of them complain about those compositions that they've had to write for <laughs> a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, in uh, the end of the story, what was the metal piece shaped like a T that Jason found in his pocket? Ah, well, you know what that is? This was a a real ancient Egyptian symbol, and it's called an Ankh, A-N-K-H. And, uh, oh, it's thousands and thousands of years old, and it looks just E, uh, with a kind of loop at the top of the crossbar. And this was uh, an Egyptian symbol for uh, life, and I suppose you could say good luck. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, this, uh, this is real. As a matter of fact, I have one on my key ring. Oh, for goodness sake. Now, uh, the boys and girls ask, will you please write another story about cats for us? Oh, no, I, I intend to do that. I'm not going to say just what it is at this point. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm so fond of cats, I think uh, sooner or later a cat is going to show up in, in one of the stories. Now, the Pride Dane series, uh, the other uh, series that we're so interested in, the Book of Three, The Black Cauldron, Castle of Lear, and Terran Wanderer. These stories are somewhat like the King Arthur stories, but there's more humor and uh, more connection between the stories. Uh, will you tell us how you happened to write these books? Well, now, here's, here's a true story, and it began, actually, when I was working on Time Cat. And now, uh, if you remember the chapter in Ireland where uh, Jason and Gareth meet St. Patrick, originally, this was going to be a a Welsh chapter, because, you know, St. Patrick was born in Wales. He was not born in Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, the way some people uh, might imagine. Yes. No, indeed, he was born in Wales. So I began my research on Wales, but I found so much and so many different kinds of fascinating stories about Wales that I realized I couldn't do it all in one chapter. So I thought, all right, all I can, I can do, I'll move 
the story from Wales and have it start right in Ireland. Then when I finished Time Cat, I went back and began really reading about the Welsh legends and the ancient mythology, and that's how the first book in the series, the Book of Three, really got started. And that those Welsh legends are in a series, and they're called the... Oh, that's a very ancient book called the Mabinogion. And, and some of these things that were, came into the Prydane series... Yes. Am I saying Prydane right? Uh, Prydane is the way I usually <gasps> say it. I'm sorry, the Prydane... I think the best way to pronounce it is the way that sounds best to you. See, these are very ancient names, and I'm not sure that anybody can really say this is absolutely the way you have to you have to say it. But it's it's from this uh, these old Welsh stories. Um, yes, and that's that's where some of the ideas came from. Of course, I as I got started, I began changing more and more until uh, the way the books really ended up, I was inventing uh, my own fairy tales and legends, and that I think is really what I wanted to do. But you have to have a background of something oh, yes. to start. Oh, yes, these, I call it a, a kind of inspiration that comes from these stories, and this is what gets you started, and then uh, from there on, it's up to your imagination how you want to, how you want to tell them. Uh, did you ever visit in Wales? I was in Wales, uh, uh, actually during World War II. I was stationed there for a while, uh, in Army Intelligence, and I had, uh, gone all through Wales, and it was such a beautiful country, that when I came to write, the Book of Three, I thought back on those days, and this is what really gave me the background for some of the descriptions and, and the places. We wondered about, uh, like, uh, the spooky places you described, such as the marshes of uh, Marsh. Oh, the marshes of Morva, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Black Lake, uh, where you would get uh, the idea for describing those, because they are so uh, hair-raising. Well, and of course the, the lovely thing about Wales is that it has so many different things. It has, oh, places of great beauty and some very scary places too. And of course the marshes of Morva, I don't think there is really such a place as that in Wales. I think I made that up. But, uh, <laughs> I've never been there. I was just trying to think of the, of the most frightening kind of uh, swamps that I could imagine. They're certainly frightening. They even frightened me, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you make a Tara an assistant pig keeper instead of, say, an assistant keeper of cows or horses? Well, now there's, there's two answers to that, and one of them is an authentic historical answer. Do you realize that pigs, and this is surprising, this is one of the things that I learned, that pigs, uh, for the Welsh, and as a matter of fact for the Greeks, and many other uh, people, were sacred animals. Uh, the, the pig in, in the book of three, Hen Wen, is an oracular pig. She can predict the future and things that are going to happen. And this is not too far off the historical fact that, uh, uh, that pigs were very mysterious animals in, in ancient days. Hmm. So first, this was one reason for having a pig. And secondly, an assistant pig keeper, well, I wanted, I didn't want a fancy hero. Mm -hmm. I wanted a, a kind of hero that everybody would read about and they'd recognize him. Mm -hmm. So that I didn't want a, uh, oh, well, let's say a, a very uh, a brave or a particularly uh, fancy kind of thing for him to do. So I thought, no, uh, since I must have a pig in the story, what uh, what better thing than to have him a pig keeper? But that was even too fancy. I thought, I'll make him an assistant pig keeper, which is just <laughs> a little bit below that. Are you going to do any more stories about the Dane series? Well, now, the, the way it turned out, and this is a funny thing, I never realized at the beginning how many books there were going to be. I started out, and when I finished the book of three, I realized that there was still more of the story that I wanted to tell. And, of course, one thing led to another, and it got to be, oh, at this point, almost a quarter of a million words long, and almost <sighs> a thousand pages, and I just finished the fifth book, which is called The High King, now, the, the thing about these books is that all each one is separate. Each one tells a separate story. But if you put them all together, you'll see that they make up one big story. And the fifth book uh, tells all the secrets about uh, Taran, the assistant pig keeper, and all the, uh, the things that uh, people have wondered about, his, his parentage and what uh, is going to happen to certain uh, different things in there. Now, I'm not going to say too much about that. That's going to spoil the surprise. Oh. But all the secrets are told in that last book. 
but we'll be watching for the high king uh, and uh, we'll be sorry to have them come to an end but we have oh, I was sorry myself <laughs> I, uh, believe it or not I I almost uh, cried when I wrote the uh, the last page of that fifth book because I I had been with it so long and it came to mean so much to me personally that I was very sad when uh, when that book ended and I, I won't guarantee that one of these days I might not uh, just go back to uh, Prudane because there's, there's always stories to be told. The picture book type you've had, Taryn, uh, let's see. Uh, the, oh, there was one. The harp and, yes, and, and, Col yeah. and the... Um, Col and his white pig. That's right. And the time... Uh, the Truthful Harp. The Truthful Harp. The Truthful harp. harp. Some of the ideas came from the longer books. Yes. For example, that, that harp, the uh, fluter flying yeah, the bard, when I mean, he has that harp, that. <laughs> every time he tells a lie, the strings break. Yeah, yes. uh, so this, the picture book, uh, tells how we got the harp. Mm -hmm. See, we don't know this in the longer right. book, so that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a little bit extra added on to the story. Well, Mr. Alexander, it's been very interesting talking to you, and you've given us such very good answers uh, to some of the questions that have been bothering us. And uh, we do thank you very much. Well, believe me, I, I love talking about Prudane, and uh, as I say, I hope one of these days maybe I'll go back to it. Well, we hope you do, too.